You ready? 2 Corinthians 13. I'll begin reading at verse 1. Paul writes, this will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I've told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now, being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So Paul has stated, and as I begin my introduction, Paul has just stated that he has a concern for the church. He had said that in chapter chapter 12. And he had made it very clear that he has a concern for the condition of the church. And he had said, I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish. Um, he's saying, I, I'm concerned when I show up that, that I'm going to be um, seeing that you're not living properly. I'm, I'm concerned that when I do arrive, I'm going to find that you're not, you're not maturing and growing in the things of the Lord you see, what he wanted was the church to grow. He wanted the church to spiritually mature. But because of the false teachers who had crept in and were influencing people, and yes, those false teachers still come into churches. Yes, they still influence people. They don't necessarily have to walk in the doors of the church. All you need to do is turn on your television. All you need to do is listen to the radio sometimes, satellite radio or whatever, and you'll hear these teachers and all. So they're continuing to influence. They don't necessarily have to walk in the way they did in, in the Corinthian church, but they certainly have infiltrated. And he's concerned. He's concerned that, that the church is not going to grow spiritually because these false teachers are undermining the maturing of their faith. You see, the desire of a pastor is that the church he serves grows and matures in the things of the Lord. The spiritual maturity of the church actually encourages the pastor. It comforts the pastor when he knows that, that the people that he shepherds are in love with Jesus Christ, it, it blesses him. It encourages him when they're in the word of God, when they're maturing spiritually. You see, I, I read social media comments daily that grieve me. There are so many people who post things they don't have an understanding of and want to debate and want to reprove and rebuke. I received a rebuke just yesterday from somebody who, who doesn't apparently know me and it happens all the time. People who are furious at their keyboard, who do nothing. They don't open up the Bible. They don't ever pray through. They've never cried a day for the church. But, but they, they're so wise and so equipped to tell others how to do what they themselves don't do. And, and I read these social media comments, and, and they grieve me. And I can tell. I can tell who reads the Bible. I can tell who attends a Bible-teaching church just by their comments. And it saddens me when I read some of the things that people feel free to post. You see, a genuine pastor actually grieves when the church isn't healthy. In Galatians 4, verse 19, Paul had said, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I'm going through the agony of watching you mature. You see, the pastor's greatest joy is when the church is living for the Lord. John wrote in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so Paul has a great concern for these Corinthians because these infiltrators have undermined the work of the Spirit. And so he's been writing all of these chapters to encourage them and, and to correct them and to warn them. And so Paul begins this particular portion of the Scripture by bringing that to them and saying, this will be the third time, verse 1, that I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. You see, Paul had opened this letter by stating that he had put off this trip. In chapter 1, verse 23, he had said, I, I call upon God as my witness that I am telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. And so he had made mention in the beginning 
concerning the fact that he had planned on being there but hadn't come. So now he's able to make the trip. And when he comes, he's making it clear, I'm going to deal with my detractors. He says, this is the third time that I'm coming to you. By mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So he's speaking about the mouth of two or three witnesses. When he speaks of two or three witnesses, that's what you have as a, what is called a precedent. It's a precedent that is established by Jewish law that somebody cannot receive an accusation, especially one with, that's a capital offense, without, without people able to, to um, validate that by a witness. And, and that's found in the Old Testament in various portions. But Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 is one example where it says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sins. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So he's saying, this is going to serve as my third witness against those who are influencing you. That's how he's using that verse in verse one here. He says in verse two, I've told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. So this follows that pattern of the threefold witness. He says, I have, I have uh, in verse 2, he says, I, I write to those who have sinned before. Uh, he, he has spoken of these earlier. They were in sin and they were remaining unrepentant. Remember as chapter in chapter 12, how he had said in verse 20, I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish and that I shall be found by... You such as you do not wish. And then he began to speak of what was taking place in the church. He says contentions and jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceit and tumults. And so he began speaking of the condition of the church. These are the people who've been influenced by the false teachers. Always remember that you begin to live what you believe. And the false teachers were teaching them things that were actually leading to them having this kind of life. And so he's spoken of this. He said, there are those who are in sin and they're remaining unrepentant. And I'm going to deal with them when I get there, is what he's saying, because sin cannot go unchallenged. But in verse 2, he also speaks of all the rest. Now, to all the rest, those, those Corinthians who are being influenced by the false teachers. So I'm going to speak to those as an apostle, Paul is saying, to those who are living ungodly lives, and I'm also speaking to those of you who are being influenced in a very direct way by these false teachers. And he says in verse 2, and I'm not going to spare you. In other words, I'm going to deal with you as your deeds deserve. I'm going to exercise my authority, and I'm going to do that through church discipline. Now, why is he telling them that? He says that to give them an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to mend their ways, if you will. If they repent and they reject the false teachers and the teachings, they're going to be restored. And restoration, by the way, restoration, when, when you've failed and you've been corrected and you've repented and you're restored, restoration into fellowship with the Lord, Lord's people is not simply feeling bad and going on as if nothing had happened. There, there are numbers of people who, who have, unfortunately, have sinned and just say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, no big deal, and they move on. That's not real restoration. That's not real repentance. Real repentance is demonstrated by a change in attitude and action. Real repentance is, is hating the sin, not making an excuse for it. We already saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So true repentance is demonstrated by a change in attitude as well as actions. And so he's speaking concerning that when he says in verse 3, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me who is not weak towards you, you see the false teachers have convinced some that Paul was a phony they wanted evidence that this man had authority. Now, he had to deal with this demand, and he did so earlier in the letter. Remember in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, he said, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others 
epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. And they went on to say, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, he had said, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Earlier, he had spoken in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and he had said in verses 1 and 2, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. What is it that they desired him to prove? They wanted him to prove that Christ was speaking in him. They wanted proof of his ministerial authority, that Christ spoke through Paul. You know, that, that is something that is common to this day. So sometimes, some, I don't know how to say this, and maybe I shouldn't. It's first service, I'll say it. Second, I won't. You know, I don't want to seem to be thin-skinned. That's a whole problem. But I'd like to use things that are relevant as examples. I don't know how many in this room here or who are listening to me at home right now. Hope you're enjoying your coffee. I don't know how many of you think of me as a, a pastor who, is, who lacks compassion and labels people evil, and has an angry disposition. Perhaps some of you think I do. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you think I'm that way. I don't know. Um, I hate you. No, I don't. <laughs> Shut your mouth. I, I don't know. Perhaps I strike you that way. And how many of you think that I'm self-righteous and judgmental? Perhaps you do. I don't know. Um, but I hope that you, those of you who know our ministry, I hope that you, I hope that you would know that that's not true of me, that I have a compassion for people. And a passion for your life to be blessed. And a, a passion for the church to live for Christ to make an impact in a very dark and lost world, and that that fuels my heart when I preach. But I would hope that you would think that after almost 50 years of walking with the Lord and 47 years of teaching the Word of God and 39 years of pastoring this church, I would hope that I've earned in some, to some degree your respect and appreciation in some ways. You know, I'm 70 years old today. I could be retired for five years, but I don't want to be. I want to serve God, and I want to serve God with you. And that's what motivates my heart. And, and that's just the truth. That's just the truth. Not all people appreciate that, and not all people want that. And, and I understand that. I really do. But you will always have people who, who will call into question and all who you are based on how they feel about what you said or what their opinion is related to how you put it. And the bottom line is the Apostle Paul, well, that's something that all ministers go through, but that's what we've been looking at in 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul had people who had crept in, who were undermining and influenced the people. And he's concerned about that because they're calling into question his qualifications to minister to them. And we've gone through this. He's already stated that he has the qualifications of an apostle. He was selected by the Lord. He'd seen the risen Christ. His letters were being circulated in the churches. They were considered authoritative. He performed the signs of an apostle. But now they're saying that they need proof that Jesus is speaking in him. In other words, we need proof that, that Jesus is inspiring Paul to communicate the things that he says. Well, 
In Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, Jesus said, it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Jesus had said that the apostles would be inspired to speak the words that God gave to them. And so in challenging Paul to exert his authority, they in reality are challenging Jesus who placed him in that position. You see, Jesus gave Paul his authority. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he said, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. But the fact that he hadn't come to them seemed to reinforce the false apostles' accusations. They could claim that, that he didn't want to come because he was afraid to see them face to face. So by delaying his arrival, he gave them time to repent, is what he is saying. I'm giving you time to deal with the situation. Don't mistake my delay as proof of being afraid to deal with problems. In second, in, rather in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Paul had said to the church, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Just because you haven't been hammered by God yet doesn't mean that he approves what you're doing. Sometimes people think that they can get away with something because nothing's happened to them yet. Therefore, God must approve this. And, and Paul had all, already had said in Romans 2, 4, Paul had said, do you think that God's patience is giving you permission? Do you think that God's patience is, is saying that he approves what you're doing? No, he's giving you time to repent. So by delaying his arrival, he gave him time to repent. In their immaturity, they were regarding his patience and his gentleness as weakness. They thought he was weak. And they presented themselves as strong. And so Paul's about to correct this. He, he's about to demonstrate to them the authority that he's been given by Jesus. And, and again, that's something he'd warned them about in 1 Corinthians 4.21. He had said to them, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? What do you want? Do you want me to arrive and bring a correction? Or do you want me to arrive so we can just have sweet fellowship? It's up to you. And as he's speaking about that, and he had said, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, verse 4, he says, though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. And so, when Jesus was crucified, he didn't resist those who killed him. He was crucified in weakness. And it appeared weak to those that took him and put him to death. This fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah was written over 700 years before Christ. And in Isaiah 53, verse 7, speaking of Messiah, Isaiah wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Messiah, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. That was fulfilled when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate kept questioning him and Jesus refused to answer him. And finally, he said to him, don't you understand? Are you answering me nothing? Do you not understand that I have the power of life and death? And, and Jesus says, you have no power unless it was given to you from above. And that's the bottom line. No man has anything that God didn't permit. And so Jesus looked weak when he was standing before Pontius Pilate. He looked weak when he carried that cross. He looked weak when they, when they nailed him to it. He looked weak when they raised it up and dropped that post into that hole and they heard that sickening thud of that post hitting and, and his body sagging and the groan that would have come out. He looked weak. He looked weak when the people walked by and their tongues began to wag. He saved others, let him save himself. If you really be God, come down off of that cross. We'll believe you. He looked weak, but he wasn't. He was showing strength. He submitted himself unto death. He voluntarily chose the weakness of mortality. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives are held in slavery by fear of death. And even today, there are still many 
who are held in slavery by fear of death. They're afraid. I don't think we should go run in front of a car so we can go to heaven quicker. I'm sure of that. But I refuse to be under the fear of death because the worst thing that will happen to me when I die is the best thing that could ever happen to anyone. I get to see Jesus face to face. Now, that's something that has removed the fear of death. Now, I don't necessarily want to die in an ugly way. I'm kind of hoping that I'm asleep on a plane <laughs> when it hits. I don't know. All I know is that one of these days I'll see him face to face. Is that bad? Is that something to be afraid of? One of these days walking with Jesus Christ in heaven? Is that something you're afraid of? Why? Why? Why would I let fear dominate my life? Now, again, I might as well go. I open the door. I might as well talk for a moment. Um, I'm not stupid. I lock my doors at home. I lock my doors in case Marie's coming after me. <laughs> I wear a seatbelt. I don't go into areas at certain times, certain places, for obvious reasons, unless God tells me to. Thank you, Jesus. He just doesn't tell me to. I just don't want to make unwise, presumptuous decisions. I'm not going to jump off of a, a roof because the angels are going to lift me up lest I dash my foot against a stone. But at the same time, I can't live afraid. I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And I really do believe my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And ultimately, though, I don't, want to, I don't want to leave my girl. I don't want to leave my Marie. I want to be with her as long as God gives me breath. But even when I go home, he's her God, too. And he will take care of my wife and my children and my grandchildren. And I'll be with him. And I'll get to see my dad and my mom and my grandfather, whom I never met. He died when my, my mom was 14, but he was a believer. I have his Bible. I get to meet my mother's mom, who was a believer. I get to meet my grandparents in heaven. I have a baby waiting for me in heaven. One of my children who died in the womb. And I have so many that have preceded me. Why would I be afraid to go there? Why would I live in such a way that it seems I have no faith. I, I'm not presumptuous. I'm not running around kissing people in the mouth saying, no, I ain't afraid of coronavirus. <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, I'm, I'm, I think there's a wisdom. Don't, don't, don't test the Lord, guys. Don't test the Lord. Don't test him. Don't presume on him. But don't live in fear either. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. That's what he's given to us. Hold fast to him. Hold fast to him. Show wisdom, but don't be afraid. You see, Jesus appeared weak. Jesus appeared weak when he went through what he went through. He appeared weak when they mocked him. He appeared weak when they fastened that crown of thorns on his head. He appeared weak when they took that staff and pressed it in and the blood flowed down his face. He appeared weak when they took that scourge and, and whipped him and ripped the skin right off of his bones. He looked weak when he carried that cross and he looked weak when he laid there and they placed him on it and when they dropped him in that hole, he looked weak. But the third day after that, he showed power by the resurrection and that's who we worship. And so, yes, you can appear weak. But Paul is making it clear, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And the strength of salvation is revealed in the righteousness and the love of the cross. He said in verse 4, he lives by the power of God. By the power of God, he was raised from, from death to life. 
You see, his father, the supreme manifestation of power, resurrected him from the dead. In Acts 13, 29 and 30, Paul said, when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. He says in verse 4, we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. We shall show you the strength of the risen Lord as we deal with these false teachers. I may appear weak, but I have the proper authority through Christ and I will use it. And because I'm empowered by him, I will wield my authority because Jesus gave me this authority. He says in verse 4 again, we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. His life is in us. We will show you that we're not as weak as our opponents say. By his authority, we will, as his apostles, deal strongly with false teachers. We're not as weak as you may think. And so as he's saying this, he goes on to say in verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you're disqualified? Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Some among you are expecting me to defend my ministry and prove that Jesus is with me as an apostle. I challenge you, examine yourself to see whether you're even saved. You seek to challenge my authority. Notice verse 3 again. We just read it. You seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. You seek to challenge my authority. But now I'm turning that around and I'm saying test yourself. Rather than cross-examining Paul, check your own heart. And he's saying, are you saved? Do you really know Christ? Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Are you sure you're saved? Because if you are saved, that proves my ministry to you is from Christ. Remember, I've quoted this more than once. He had said to them in 1 Corinthians 4, he had said, though you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have but one Father. I begot you in the gospel. And so if you are turning away from or being influenced away from the things that, that I've shared with you, look at your own heart and see whether or not you're even saved. You want to challenge my authority? How about challenging your own? In Philippians 3, verse 15, he said, let all who are spiritually immature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. Examine yourself. Here's something for us. A real practical, I think, practical application again in verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in Christ. Test yourselves. How do you know you're saved? You feel safe today and you don't feel safe tomorrow? You know, a lot of people today, and, and I, I see that as uh, an observation, not simply a criticism, an observation um, and it's a natural thing, by the way. It's not something that I'm saying is, is um, something I can't understand. I do understand this, that our feelings sometimes are what we rely on. You know, if it feels good, you know, it, 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 it can't be wrong if it feels so right, that kind of thing. You know, I, it, my feelings are my truth. We, we hear that all the time. You know, it's my truth. You know, like, like, Everybody's got a brand of truth, and there's no such thing as a standard for truth. And today we live in a world of opinions where people's opinions are regarded as equal to Scripture's commands. And so if I don't like what it says or it doesn't feel comfortable for me, then therefore it must be wrong, or I'll review it or come back to it at a later date and all of that. And so we're living in a time where our feelings are what determines our faith. And the problem is, is that's not how it works. What we have is we have facts. And then we place our faith in the facts, which produces the feelings. And sometimes the feelings are, are confused, so we have to go back to the facts. What does God's word say? And then we trust that, and then God has a way of working through our feelings. When I first got saved, you know, I, I had this exhilaration. As a matter of fact, it was so great that my wife, Marie, who, who, who knows my testimony, a good portion of it, 
when she got saved, she was really concerned that she may not be. And, and I asked her, why is that? And she says, because when you got saved, you, you had this exhilaration. You had this, this, you talk about how a uh, weight was removed from your shoulders. And, and I never had those feelings. So Marie told me that uh, from the beginning. I, I, I never had those feelings. Well, Marie had a different life than I did. I, I had a lot of things that, that I was washed from. I had a lot of sin that had burdened me. Marie's life was different than mine. She didn't carry those things. And so for her, she thought because she didn't feel this exhilaration, she wasn't saved. And, and even from the beginning, I said, it's never our feelings. It's always a fact. It's what God did. God so loved that he gave. Jesus Christ said, if you believe in me, you're going to have life. If you confess Christ as Lord and Savior, trusting him with, with all of your, your heart, placing your faith in him, you're born again. And, and those are the facts. That's what scripture says. But the feelings will follow. And sometimes you may have this exhilaration. You may, during the worship, there's, there's times during worship where a song, a certain lyric, you know, the song Devotion, it's an old song, but it's a song that's, that's my song. That's one of my favorite Christian songs because it speaks my heart deeply because that's what I have for him. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. See, I tear up. It's okay. I don't, I'm not comfortable with it, but I do it because I'm opening my heart to you. That means something to me. But I'm not saved by the feeling I have. I'm saved by the fact of what he did. And that's how it works. That's Christianity. And see, how do you know you're saved? It's not by your feelings. It's by what God says. So John tells us in 1 John, if you take notes, you might want to note this. 1 John gives us various insights. Uh, one of the things is that I know that I'm saved. How can I know I'm saved? Is that, that, uh, that his word becomes something that I cling to and I want to obey. Obedience to the Lord is, is, is revealing of my faith. Uh, I keep his command. Do you desire to obey God? Do you want to do what he says in his word? In 1 John 2, 3 and 4, John said, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. So somebody who says, oh, I love Jesus, but they're constantly in sin. John says, that's not, you're not telling the truth. Because somebody who loves Jesus Christ may not become perfect, but his heart and her heart desires to obey him. And the life does change. In John 14, 15, Jesus said it like this. If you love me, keep my commandments. A second thing that can help you to test your own heart to see whether Christ is in you is love. It's love for God and it's love for other people because love is the earmark of a believer. It's been called the birthmark of a Christian. Love. Even the early pagans would write, one famous writer said, behold how they love one another. That was the mark of the believer. In 1 John 3 verse 11, this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. And if you love one another, the world that doesn't love one another sees that as an evidence that you, you've been born from above. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, dear friends, let us love one another. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So what happens in your life when you come to faith in Christ? You begin to love people. You begin to care about them, strangers even, that, that sometimes your heart may well up with pain or sorrow when you see them in a condition that they're in. And, and it's because you care. You care for the people who don't know Christ. And then you develop these deep bonds with those who do. You actually begin having a family, you know, in, 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 and it's a face-to-face it's a -face family, by the way. Um, because what we've done with the advent of so much of the, uh, the, the social media that we have is we've replaced uh, messages and, and uh, even online viewing of, of, of um, worship services. We've replaced that with the real, real life being close to actual living human beings. One of the things that, that uh, I, I have great concern about uh, with this uh, isolation that people are in is it's increasing depression. There are more suicides, uh, there's more drugs being taken, uh, more violence in the home. Uh, these things through the isolation and the continuing uh, depression that people are experiencing, 
you know, we need each other, guys. That's why I, I, I am I am blessed that, you, that you're here right now. I'm blessed by that. And I hope that, that you are refreshed in being around people. And, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know, the first thing God ever says is not good is that the man should be alone. And the isolation that we've been placed into is actually a bad thing. And, and, I, and I, I believe very strongly that one of the evidences that I know God is, is my love for one another. A love for you and, and our love for each other. And do you have love for, for people? The third thing is generosity and service, prompted by the love and example of Christ. Generosity and service, prompted by the love and example of Christ. In 1 John 3, 17 and 18, whoever has his world's goods, sees his brother in need, shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth generosity and service in Galatians 5 13 brethren you've been called to liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another do you, are you a generous spirit do you do you want to help somebody do you care for others that's a good evidence that you know the Lord a fourth thing is the internal witness of the Holy Spirit the one who bears witness with our spirit there's this internal witness. In 1 John 4, 13, we know that we live in him, and he in us, because he's given us of his spirit. In 1 John 5, 10, he went on to say, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. My mom used to say, I know that I know that I know that Jesus lives within me. There's that witness within you. There's that sense that he's in you, and you want to tell people about that. My mom was at the doctor's, and and uh, the doctor, my mom had a series of illnesses from the time she was a very young woman. And so there she is at the doctor's office and the doctor is speaking to her and is about to listen to her heart. So he takes out his stethoscope and, and he places his stethoscope on my mom's heart. And my mother says to him, do you hear him? Now he's saying, this crazy old lady, what are you talking about? Do I hear him? You know, seriously, he's looking at my mom says, you should have seen his face, David. Because he had his stethoscope on my heart. And I said, did you hear, do you hear him? And he looks at, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, hear who? And she says, Jesus, he lives in my heart. Let me tell you how he got to live in there. My mom used to share with people and take opportunities to. Why? Because she loved the Lord and she loved people. That's an evidence. You don't want someone to go to hell. Do you believe in hell? You don't want people to go there. So you tell them about Jesus Christ who saves them, transforms their life because you love them. And the Holy Spirit within you prompts you to share. In Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are God's children. You see, that leads to what I just said, our desire to tell the world about Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. In John 3, 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do you know him? Examine yourself. Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? Were you to be standing before him and were you in a, a, a heavenly tribunal and, and he is the judge is there and he says, why should I allow you to enter into my kingdom? What is it that you say to him? I tried hard. I went to church. I gave things away. I served in a soup kitchen when it was Thanksgiving. I would go and serve meals to people at a mission. What do you tell them? And the only answer that will get you into heaven is I was a sinner saved by the grace of God. Jesus died on a cross for me. He washed me and cleansed me with his blood. He was buried the third day. He arose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. He sent his Holy Spirit. I received Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And the only thing that makes me able to enter into your kingdom is what he did for me. And that's how God will say, enter into the joy of your Lord, because that's how you enter into the kingdom of heaven. It isn't because you're so good because you're not. It's because he's so good that he made it possible for you. That's how you know. Because so many people think, well, I try hard. I go to church. No, he said, examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. You see, a genuine believer has confidence that the Lord is in them. Now, it is good to do a personal inventory because there's such a thing as self-deception. He was confident that the majority would pass the personal inventory, but others might not. But they could still repent. 
They could exercise saving faith. They could be forgiven. They could be saved. They could know that Jesus saved them. But he says some might be disqualified. Notice verse 6, I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified because he had just said in verse 5, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? That word disqualified was used when you tested metals and coins. It, it speaks about not standing the test. It, it's that which does not prove itself as it ought. It's unfit. It's, 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 it's a counterfeit. It's worthless. And you go to the bank and, and you give them your, your cash and they, they put it through machine and they test it to see whether or not it's a counterfeit, and a counterfeit will be spit out of that counting machine. Well, some people have a real appearance that they're good. There are some people who are, by the standards of the world, let's face it, are, are, are good people. They're caring people. They're serving people. They're generous people. They're, they're nice people. They're the kind of people you like to be around and, and all of that. But they don't have a saving faith. And then when you put them next to someone who claims to be a Christian who has no joy, you know, who doesn't love, who doesn't serve at all. And they say, well, I'm going to heaven because, and the other guys, well, they look at the different lives and they wonder. And, and so I think it's really something that we ought to be aware of. How, how, how can I know that I'm saved? Well, genuine faith is revealed in repentance. Genuine faith is revealed in a desire to live a righteous life. Genuine faith is revealed by sincere holiness. It's revealed by a willing obedience to God through his word. Genuine, genuine faith is, is a, having an actual real love for God's word and a love for him. You see, some in the church were actually unsaved, and that made them open to false prophets. That's the condition of the church today. We lack discernment because of a lack of personal devotion to prayer and the word. And when you don't, sp don't spend time in prayer and the word and fellowship with genuine believers, guys, you're vulnerable to deception. You're vulnerable. When you're not spending personal time in the word and when you're not spending time in prayer and not having healthy fellowship, you're vulnerable. You see, the pastor has a responsibility of teaching the whole counsel of God because that's intended to safeguard the sheep and it reveals the heart of a, a true pastor John uh, 21 tells us, beginning at verse 17, that he had said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Feeding sheep is the calling of a shepherd. And feeding sheep reveals the love for Christ. And that is so important that Paul made a strong statement to them. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, he said, Awake to righteousness, do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. You have people in church that you've not cared enough to challenge and encourage for them to know Jesus Christ. You have people who are gathered, and that took place early in the church, it does to this day, who go to church thinking themselves to be Christian or believers and you're not teaching them what God actually says. And because that's true, there are unsaved people who are calling themselves Christians, convinced that they are. And I say this to your shame because you haven't been clear with them. You know, when I teach, and I'm about to close, a couple of final thoughts. I've shared this at pastors' conferences. Let me share it with you very briefly, very briefly. I've shared this with fellow Calvary Chapel pastors more than once. I've told the church, you need to look at the people that you minister to. Be very careful, I've told pastors, that you don't get caught up with this quest for fame, for this desire for greatness. Be very careful that you don't become the centerpiece of your church. When you look up here towards this pulpit, look behind me, and that's the whole purpose of this church. We would see Jesus. Because one of these days, and it's not that long, you know, I'm an old man. Another man will be behind this pulpit. A younger man. Prayerfully a good man. 
And as I'm looking for that future, he has to be more than just a good-looking guy. <laughs> or used, used to be. He needs to be more than a good-looking guy, an eloquent speaker, a forceful personality, visionary, eloquent, good communicator, knowledgeable of Scripture. All of those things would be pluses. What he needs is he needs to love Jesus, and he needs to love you. I will never put anybody in this pulpit to take this fellowship if they don't love you. I don't care how well he speaks. I don't care how strong he is. If he doesn't love you, I will not place him in this pulpit because you need a shepherd who loves you. You need someone who will teach you the truth, but who loves you with all of his heart. And that's what I'm looking for. And in the future, that's what I'm going to leave behind. Because that's how it should be. And a shepherd needs to teach the sheep line upon line, precept by precept, a little bit here and a little bit there. So you get the whole counsel of God. Because I've shared with the pastors, take a moment and look at the sheep. Because out here is a woman who lost her husband. And she's a widow living without a man she lived with for years. There's somebody over there who just lost their dad. And there's somebody over here whose child is very sick. And there's somebody here who's lost the job. And there's somebody here who's going through tension with the neighbor. There's somebody, there are so many, so many tears that arrive on a Sunday morning. So many needs. So many, so many people with, with concern. So many people with, with pain. They carry it on their shoulders every day and then they come to church on Sunday and they and what? They encounter a guy who wants to use them to, to pad his resume to say, I've got so many people who show up, I just don't have enough room for them. No. Jesus not only looked at the, the multitude, he looked at the individual also. And he cared about the individual as well as the multitude. And that's what Christianity is. And that's what Paul is saying. And that's the kind of thing he is, is, is. Paul was a shepherd. He cared about these sheep and these false teachers were creeping in, undermining their faith. And he said, who is indignant? And I don't burn when somebody uses you and hurts you. It causes me anger. Why? Because I'm fleshly. No, because I love you and I don't want you taken advantage of because I care for you and I want you to follow Christ. And I want you to wake up because there are people who are amongst you who don't know the Lord. I say this to your shame. The leadership is failing to preach and teach clearly and unbelievers are becoming comfortable. That's why I have strong opinions related to the direction of this nation. But no president's ever going to make us a better nation. Only Jesus can. And that's why we keep our eyes on him. That's why. You see, in contrast to the false teachers, Paul was the real thing. And when the word is rightly divided, it produces a well-fed, healthy, growing congregation. But it also prunes the vine of those who aren't interested in following Jesus Christ. When the word is rightly divided, it builds up believers and it purges those who aren't interested. That's how it works. And so that's how ministry is. So he says, teach the word of God. I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. I trust that you will know we're the real deal because we love you and we've given our life to share with you.